Hello and welcome back to uh, the channel. My name is Dr. James Gill and you've joined us for another uh, in-depth uh, examination review looking at the clinical skills for how to do the thyroid examination. So we're joined again by Abby who's going to help us go through that thyroid uh, status assessment. So to start off, we want to actually observe the patient before they come into the room. We want to watch them walking down the corridor. How are um, you know, they moving? Do they appear agitated? Do they feel particularly slow? Does it look as if there's been any obvious changes to their weight? Are their clothes tighter than you might expect or may have seen before? Similarly, we can also look at the patient's belt buckles. Does it look like they've lost weight and had to tighten all the way through? Are there any easy signs that might help us to think this is a hyper or hypothyroidism patient? When the patient is sat down, uh, obviously we're going to greet them. So could you please confirm your name and date of birth, please? Uh, Abby Swartz, 7th of December, 1996. <laughs> Thank you. And at the same time, we're going to make sure that we're gelling our hands so that we're all safe and secure. Obviously, we would have washed our hands anyway before seeing each patient, but I think the extra step is always worthwhile. So to start off with the thyroid patient, as I say, we are going to observe them from the end of the bed and comment about their general status. Do they seem calm and anxious? Is there any sort of puffiness to the face that we might think about with a hypothyroidism? And then we're going to start off with the hands. So if you could put your hands out in front, please. Now, there's a plethora of things that we need to look at uh, in the hands. So starting off with the nails, we can't see any cholinechia, so spoon shaping of the nails, we might associate with an iron deficiency anemia. We can't see any clear issues with excess sweating or if there's any abnormal temperatures. We can't see in a very important sign, something called thyroid acropatchy, where we have swelling of the distal phalanxes, uh, the tufts there, the bones, which can be quite painful. Thankfully, there's no evidence of that here. We've got a normal capillary refill, so easily less than uh, two seconds. But similarly, we're not a, 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 a very a hyperdynamic circulation, which might suggest a hyperthyroidism. If you could turn your hands over. We're again going to have a look to see um, if the signs of anemia from the uh, palmar creases, which can become pale uh, in hypothyroidism. On the converse, we can have palmar erythema, where the palms become bright red, which can be seen in various conditions such as liver cirrhosis, in pregnancy, and also in hyperthyroidism. A crucial thing that we need to do is get the patient to put their fingertips together um, with their nails touching so we can see if there's any signs of clubbing. Here we're looking for Shamroth's sign, the presence of a window at the top of the nails showing there is no clubbing. With a thyroid patient, the presence of clubbing might strongly suggest a hyperthyroidism case because it is only seen in graves as opposed to hypothyroidism. So if you continue to put your hands outstretched, one of the things that we may see with a hyperthyroidism case is uh, a fine tremor. Now that may be something that we can see uh, straight away, but possibly not. In which case, we can put a bit of paper on the um, hands to see if that tremor becomes exaggerated. Now, thankfully, apart from a slight anxiety in front of the cameras, uh, there is no uh, tremor here. If there was, we'd see a significant increase in the mobility of the paper there. So I'm a bear of very small brain, so I like to work in straight lines. So having had a look at the hands, I'm going to progress up the arm, doing the uh, blood pressure, and then having a look at the patient's face. So with that in mind, if I'm going to stretch out both hands, please, and I'm going to check the pulse at both, uh, both sides using my index and middle finger. So I'm checking for a radial, radial delay from a cardiology perspective. Um, whilst not thyroid, I'm still getting extra information. At this point, I'm checking for the patient's uh, pulse rate. So we're going to count for um, 15 seconds and multiply the number by four. We're looking for a pulse that is less than 100 beats per minute, so not a tachycardia. And we're looking for a pulse that is faster than 60 beats per minute, not a bradycardia. So we'd see a bradycardia with hypothyroidism and a tachycardia with anxiety or hyperthyroidism. I also okay. want to know what the rhythm is, and I've got a nice regular rhythm there, one, two, one, two. There's no arrhythmias and there's certainly no atrial fibrillation, which may be suggested from hyperthyroidism. 
I'm then going to continue up to have a look at the arm. So if you could just roll up your sleeve, please. And I'm going to take the pulse again at uh, the brachial artery. So if you just move your arm slightly for me, there we go. So that's caused the biceps to contract. I can feel the bicep tendon and I'm just checking for that pulse medially to the bicep tendon. Now I'm feeling here um, for the character of the pulse. Is it a thick bounding pulse or is it a weak thready pulse? So again, differentiating hypothyroidism versus hypothyroidism. Thankfully here with Abby with no thyroid problems, we have a normal pulse. At this stage, it would be uh, useful to do a blood pressure and then we carry on to have a look at the face. As we mentioned, we may see um, a, a swelling of the face, so edema, if we've got a hypothyroidism. We might also notice a changes to the hair. Hair might become thin and brittle with hypothyroidism or become waxy with um, hypothyroidism. Similarly, we can assess the eyebrows where um, hypothyroidism, we lose the outer one third. We're then going to focus to the eyes at this point. Again, I can't see any puffiness around the eyes. So we're then going to have a look to see if there's any signs of anemia. So if you could pull your eyelids down for me. Okay, and we've got excellent conjunctiva on both sides, so no problems there. We're going to double check that though by having a look at the mouth. So if you could show us your tongue, please. Okay, and again, there's no signs of anemia there. Okay, so we're just going to open nice and wide for me. Say, ah, ah, okay, and there's no problems down there at the back of the throat, and there's no signs of anemia there, so that's perfect. We're going to carry on with the eyes for a moment, and we're going to have a look for something called lid lag. So, Abby, I'm going to place my finger here, and I need you to keep your head still, but just follow my finger with your eyes. So up and down, up and down. And what I'm looking for here, we're going to do this slowly now, is as my finger goes up, I'm looking at the fact that Abby's eyes are looking at my finger. And as I drop it quickly, her pupils follow down, but her lid remains covering the top of her um, iris, the coloured part of her eye. If we have hyperthyroidism, then we can have a lid lag, whereby as the hand moves down and the eyes follow it, we see a white over the iris because the lid is literally lagging behind um, the, uh, the movement of the eye. And this would be seen in hyperthyroidism. With that, we also want to assess the, uh, the movement of the eye. So keeping your head still again, if you could follow my finger, please. Tell me if there's any double vision at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm watching Abby's eyes going to the full extent of their movement. If there's going to be any double vision, I'd expect to see it toward the peripheries because something like hyperthyroidism may result in inflammation behind the eye. It may result in inflammation to the muscles. So you may have a slight change in the position of the orbit, the eyeball itself. Now we're binocular visioned creatures. We expect our eyes to be placed forwards all the while. If we lose that binocular vision, they've come out of alignment. That's when we get double vision. Now, somebody may have severe hyperthyroidism and present with something called exophthalmos or proptosis, where the eyes are visibly coming forward. So we'd expect a visual problem to be presented quite early there. However, in very subtle cases, we may not be able to see that clinically, but we may pick it up if they identify double vision. Now, going back to the exophthalmos and proptosis, I'm just having a look at Abby's eyes from the side and everything appears normal. But I need to step behind to also have a look from uh, the back. So if you could lean backwards slightly. And I'm looking over Abby's face, looking at the position of her eyeball, of the orbit itself, and whether or not it's pushing forwards compared to where it would be normally. Thankfully, that's not the case here. As we're behind the patient at this point, we're also going to assess the lymph nodes. So I need to make sure the patient is aware. I'm going to put my hands on their neck and palpate around. So I'm just going to put my hands on your neck. You're going to, and we're going to see if we can find any lumps and bumps back there. So we're just going to check under your chin. So checking submental and submandibular along the uh, jawline, checking parotid and tonsillar, then pre and post auricular and then checking at the back for the occipital, and then over your deep 
and superficial chains on the neck. We can't find anything untoward. That's good. And thankfully, there are no obvious issues at this point. Now, whilst I'm behind at the patient, we're also going to have a look at their thyroid. So I'm going to again put my hands on the patient's neck and I'm trying to assess the location of their thyroid. So there's trachea. There's the isthmus of the thyroid, or should be. I can't find any lobes there, so that's good. So your thyroid is largely impalpable, which is what we'd expect here. So that's very reassuring. But if we did find any abnormalities there, we'd want to trace out what it was we were finding. Was there uh, an irregularity? Was there a change to the surface texture? Could we feel a lump? Could we feel one side of the thyroid being enlarged? There are lots of things that we may be able to identify. So we need to have a little bit of a closer look at the thyroid. So for this here, I'm going to get you to lean backwards for me and lie on the bed. And if you could just lean backwards for me. Okay. And if you move your hair forwards. Okay. And now I'm going to put my hand on the patient's chest and percuss over the chest to see if there's any sign of a retrosternal thyroid, a thyroid that has gone down um, in the neck. Okay, so I just want to uh, percuss over your chest, so it's going to involve me putting a hand on your chest. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, so we've got an excellent uh, resonant sound there, so we know there's no signs of a retrosternal goiter. So we also need to have a look at how the thyroid moves with swallowing. So we can do that initially with the pen torch. So if you can open your mouth, please, and put your tongue out. Okay. And thank you. And as she put her tongue out, we did see a small movement there at the neck. We're going to confirm this now. If you could take a sample of water, please. And hold it, please. And then swallow. OK, I'm going to do the same again. I'm going to come from, uh, stand behind you. I'm going to put my hands on your neck. If you could take the water in your mouth, please. And then swallow, please. Super, that's all normal. Okay, so we've got a normal motion there, so that's really reassuring. Now, because the whole uh, blood supply of the body will actually pass through the thyroid uh, in, within minutes, um, it's vitally important that in uh, a thyroid examination we listen over um, the thyroid to see if there's any thyroid brewers, a turbulent whooshing sound of the blood going by. So to do that, we get the patient to move their hair back from the neck. We're going to take our stethoscope and we're going to breathe with the patient. So take a deep breath in for me and hold it. That's fine and breathe normally. Okay, we'll do the same again. Deep breath in, hold it. And breathe normally once again. So there's no signs of any brewers there. So we're going to continue with the rest of the examination. We need to continue on by uh, checking the patient's reflexes. So if you could uh, spin your legs around to sit on the other side of the bed. So we're going to check on the upper limb, we're going to check at the, um, uh, at the bicep and also uh, down at the wrist. Okay, so Abby's nicely uh, making sure that we can get to that region first. So if you could just slightly flex your arm please. Okay, that's great. So I've found the bicep tendon and I'm going to strike directly over it. Okay, so we've got a good reflex there. We're going to do the same again on the opposite side, making sure we're comparing one side to the other all the way through. And striking directly down, and we can see that contraction. And then we're going to check down near the wrist, so if you just relax for me. Perfect, and same again. Excellent, so we've got good reflexes there. We now need to have a look at the knees, so if we just uncross your legs, please. Okay, and just relax for me. A nice loose and proper. And we're just going to check uh, over the um, patella tendon. Okay, so we've got a good reflex there. And then on the opposite side. Okay, so we've got a slightly brisk reflex there, though. Um, you did mention a little bit of anxiety <laughs> before we started today, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> so we know that Abby's not got any signs of hyperthyroidism, so we're probably not going to put that down to anything significant. But we do need to check the reflexes on your ankles, so if you could swing your legs back onto the bed for me. Okay, so we're just going to have a look at the reflexes of your ankles. Just let me move your leg, please. Stay nice, loose and floppy. I'm going to strike the ankle. Excellent, and relax for me. I'll do the same again. Nice, loose and floppy. 
brilliant, we've got an excellent response there. Terrific reflexes there. Uh, we need to check for any peripheral edema by pressing on the inside of the tibia, and that should be enough to displace any fluid there, which would indicate the presence of peripheral edema, which we would associate with hypothyroidism. So we haven't found any abnormalities today, apart from happy slightly brisk reflexes, uh, but we're going to put that down to uh, the cameras uh, watching things today. So, uh, to complete our examination, we want to check an ECG to uh, make sure there was no signs of uh, arrhythmia that we hadn't picked up manually. And we'd also, to complete it, want to have a look at any blood panels that have been done, particularly a full blood count, to again make sure there's absolutely no anemia, and also the thyroid function test, the TSH, so that we know the status of the thyroid biochemically as well as clinically. Well, I hope that's been a useful video for you all. Um, please consider liking the video. It's been a benefit because that tells YouTube we're here. And please put any comments down below and we'll see if we can help you out with any questions about the thyroid status. Thanks so much. Take care. We'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.